yourself among the golden cloisters and gardens of Cambridge University in England. You're 20. You're American born, but English educated, very tall, very charming, and very rich. Your annual allowance is a cool $1 million a year in today's dollars. When you came up to Trinity, you brought your valet, a small Picasso, and formal evening clothes. During the term breaks, you might fly to South Africa to race in a Grand Prix. You might spend a week at the Hotel Athene in Paris with your girl. You might entertain your friends at your family's little 800-acre Devon estate. But you're not just a bright young thing out of an Evelyn Waugh novel. You're also Sir Galahad. Your mother, one of America's wealthiest women, supports progressive causes from the New Republic magazine to the New School for Social Research, both still alive and thriving today. The most prominent members of America's and Britain's cultural and political elite are your intimate family friends. Most of them have known you since you were in diapers. You're even a serious student, a first-rate economist. Scoring first on the notoriously difficult economic tripos, one you have place at the lunch table of John Maynard Keynes and in his Monday night seminar as well as in the creme de la creme of secret societies, the Cambridge Apostles. You even won an election for president of the Cambridge Union. He's handsome, gifted, versatile, precocious, virile, complained a classmate. What on earth is he not? The world is in crisis, but it's your oyster. Michael Whitney Strait. Michael Whitney Strait, scion of one of the great American fortunes, excites the kinds of questions that Henry James asked about Isabel Archer. What will he do? How will he spend his gifts, his opportunities? As Keynes's disciple spreading intellectual revolution. As a business tycoon like his older brother, as a liberal, reform-minded politician. The future publisher of the New Republic and chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts under President Kennedy does none of the above. At the age of 20, a few months before he is about to graduate from Trinity College, he decides instead that he'll become an NKVD mole in the FDR administration, and that he will spy for one, the government of one of history's most murderous regimes just as his comrades and mentors in Trinity College's underground communist movement, Guy Francis de Monsey Burgess and Anthony Frederick Blunt knew you would. This is John Cornford, a very famous photograph, a, uh, an undergraduate Lenin at Trinity. This is Anthony Blunt, who um, wrote in his 1944 NKVD autobiography. You already know that the actual recruits whom I took were, and Michael Strait is at the top of the list. This is, I'm sure you'll recognize, the very hot Guy Burgess. Uh, this. Um, Cornford went to Spain 
and um, at the end of, of 1936. What was Michael Strait thinking? We know that adolescent boys are notoriously attracted to violence, secret brotherhoods, and crazy dares. But Strait's first report to Moscow um, a few months later has a dash of the Lord of the Flies. Spoke to Roosevelt and his wife, he reports breezily. He went back to... Um, he went back to um, the United States during a semester break to check out what he might do for the NKVD. And he had tea at the White House. Spoke to Roosevelt and his wife. Karen, my parents know RT well. I know Harry Hopkins in the Social Insurance Division, Henry Wallace, Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Morgenthau, Secretary of the Treasury. I could easily find any position. For Harold Philby, the future head of counterintelligence and other things, and for Martha Dodd, the daughter of the American ambassador to Berlin, the first act of espionage involved rifling the confidential files of their own much-loved parents. For Michael Strait, it was rifling his mother's Rolodex, plotting to plunder old and valued family friendships. What was he thinking? Well, maybe it was love. Maybe the kind of love that makes people do crazy things. He did tell his mother uh, about um, you know, half a year after he got to Cambridge and he met some of these people, like Burgess, Blunt, Cornford. He says, I'm filled with a violent, uncontrollable love for these new communist friends, an extraordinary sense of comradeship. That, quote, unreasonable and inexplicable feeling led him to join the Communist Party, become the party's orator at Trinity, funnel much of his allowance to the British Communist Party's daily worker. That is, as much as he could spare, quote, without feeling the pinch. But it was probably his best friend, John Cornford's martyrdom in Spain Cornford, who was a poet and only a year older than, um, than Michael Strait, was one of the first members of the International Brigade to be killed in Spain. Um, what we can't forget are the words and images and ideas of the 1930s. Two violent, dysfunctional, totalitarian regimes, two extremes of the political spectrum exploited hatred and fear in that era to increase their power at the expense of the democratic middle. Hitler and Stalin manipulated demonic, apocalyptic images of their enemies to strip them of their humanity, Jews, kulaks, imperialists, degenerates, social fascists, traitors, they use Manichaean propaganda to frame the political debate. It's fascism or communism. It's black shirts or red flags. It's them or us. They borrowed the language and imagery and cadence of the Book of Revelation, which, by the way, was Friedrich Engels' favorite uh, book in the Bible. Um, society splits into two opposed camps. There's a final battle. Rome falls. The oppressed received justice. The oppressors are judged. And history ends. Time is running out. You only have two choices. It's good or evil. It's life or death. It's us or them. What side are you on? Which side are you on? What are you prepared to do? 
John Cornford gave his life. What are you prepared to do, Michael? This is what Anthony Blunt said. It's a hateful message. It was a powerful message. And as we see, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. OK. I'll just back up one minute. Because this is the Department of State, which shared a building with War and Navy uh, before 19. Uh, 41. This is uh, the Department of State that is in 1937, which is where Michael Strait goes. And this is the, um, the NKVD agent who he meets. All right. Now, you can say goodbye to those honey-colored arches and those golden boys of Cambridge University who by Auden's account, never learn to be good. You're 4,000 miles away in a small American college town just south of Green Bay, Wisconsin, 100 miles north of Milwaukee. I'm sure you all know where, where it is. <laughs> uh, it's on a river. Uh, it has some industry, some mills, and it has a sweet little college. It's spring 1934, a few months after FDR's landslide. You look exactly like the middle-aged, balding professor of economics that you, in fact, are. You're short, you're plump, blue-eyed, bespectacled. You're typically seen trotting to class wearing a three-piece suit and carrying a briefcase. You're the son of upwardly mobile Jewish immigrants from Lithuania. You were sufficiently hungry as a high school student in Boston, Massachusetts, hungry for genteel, gentile, I should say, gentility, to add Dexter to your name. You're whip smart, if not exactly a model scholar, but you spend the first seven years from high school, not at Columbia, not at Stanford or Harvard, certainly not at Cambridge, but behind the counter of a hardware store where you learn to suck up to customers, bite your tongue, and hide your hot temper and burning ambition. It was torture to have to wait until 30 years old to get your BA for another 10 before you got your PhD and could finally start living your real life. You never forgot how much lost time you had to make up. Not at the moment that you are complaining. Despite a desperate job market, intense anti-Semitism, you managed to land a very handsome job offer with tenure at the rank of associate professor at a quite a respectable middle art, liberal arts college. You published a well-received book. Your manifesto for fighting the depression with deficit spending and easy money has made you, if not precisely a household name, a name familiar to the people who count from Chicago to the nation's capital. You are, in fact, you must admit, where you spent two decades wanting to go, as far from the store and as far from that counter as it was possible to get. Meanwhile, your ideas have been changing. Action, not reflection, has become the beau ideal of the 1930s. There's a consensus expressed even in the student newspaper that the complexity of modern problems requires direct action. At Harvard, 
where you got your PhD, your closest friends combined an embrace of Keynes's activist economic theory with activist Communist Party politics. You never had time for party meetings or patience for Marxist doctrine, but you have seen the future and you are convinced that it works. Not in the US of A, obviously, which is mired in depression, but in Soviet Russia, the most powerful nation on earth, you think. In fact, you're studying Russian so that you can go to Moscow for a year to learn how those planners at Gosplan made unemployment obsolete. Yet the idea of studying in Moscow, which seemed so thrilling only a few months ago, now seems a bit timid for such dangerous times in which we live. Right here, right now, in Republican Wisconsin, furious farmers are spilling truckloads of milk and attacking sheriff's deputies. Strikers are striking frequently and they're blowing things up. Communists, actual real communists and actual real fascists are all over the state fanning every flame that they can find. American society seems to be breaking down and you're terribly alarmed by the Nazification of Germany and the warlike threats emanating from Berlin. The world is obviously approaching a crisis. What is to be done? If you are Harry Dexter White, Harry Dexter White, um, <coughs> the balding 40-year-old associate professor that you've just been imagining that you were, um, and the unlikely architect, far in the future, of the post-war, post-World War II monetary system and a great deal else, you know exactly what you're going to do. You're gonna seize a chance to go to Washington, D.C. that very summer of 1934 to conduct a study for the U.S. Treasury. And the summer's, when the summer's over, you're gonna find a way to stay. Now, doesn't that look more impressive than the State Department? With a little help from your, those same old graduate school friends who have been trickling into town, that is into Washington, D.C., one after the other ever since the election, the New Deal is, is swelling the federal government like one of those little Japanese sponges that grows into a, um, a garden in your bathtub. Um, and with the help, of course, also of your native brilliance and aggressiveness, you succeed. You don't even wait to see whether your one-year contract that you got at the end of that summer um, is renewed before you inform the dean, the dean in Appleton, that you're resigning. Nothing that you've spent 20 years striving for, not the professorship, not tenure, not the white clabbered farmhouse, is worth as much as a chance to make the world safer for America, for Russia, and for Harry White you are prepared to bet the ranch. <clears throat> Harry White's gamble paid off. By the time the United States went to war half a dozen years later, he was one of the most powerful men in Washington. Indeed, he was the power behind Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau's throne, as well as the Secretary's personal rocket scientist, strategist, speechwriter, negotiator, and confidant, and General Dog's body. Uh, there is uh, Morgenthau. He was very close to, um, to FDR. 
And uh, the Treasury, of course, is always one of the most powerful agencies of government. Um, the morning after Pearl Harbor, Henry Morgenthau gathered his aides together and said that from thence on, uh, Harry Dexter White was going to handle all foreign matters. Quote, I want it all in one brain, and I want it in Harry White's brain. Um, high on Harry White's agenda was unswerving and unstinting support for Soviet Russia. His genuine convictions, his single-mindedness, noted by um, example um, John Maynard Keynes, and most of all, his remarkable relationship with one of the most important members of the Roosevelt cabinet made white one of the most effective government officials in wartime Washington. That someone in his position would risk his large ambitions, his immense opportunities to engage in espionage is uh, unbelievable and unfathomable. In fact, the man who spent, um, uh, who's sitting right next to Harry White, really he and the secretary were inseparable when um, if um, uh, you knew just by looking at Harry White's face whether the secretary was having a good day or a bad one because they were really connected, um, you know, like with an umbilical cord. Um, that someone who spent every day in Harry White's company, that is, Morgan that died unable to decide whether his most trusted aide was guilty or innocent. In fact, White had his first title at the US Treasury, Special Economic Assistant, for less than six months, when in uh, early 1935, he, one of his, again, those graduate school friends uh, who were half communist and half Keynesians, um, uh, stopped by and proposed that he, that he might use his uh, new job at the Treasury uh, to uh, help the anti-fascist cause, AKA our neighbor to the East. White had, of course, expected to help his buddies, virtually all of whom were in the party, into Treasury jobs, but now he agreed to do a lot more, namely to pass potentially interesting information to the party and possibly beyond. He very soon was meeting every few weeks with a man who, I forget uh, uh, whether he knew him as Carl or some one of Whitaker Chambers, many, many uh, aliases. Um, to pass along um, uh, treasury documents, gossip, information. Um, Whitaker Chambers, uh, of course, uh, was a brilliant and eccentric uh, young man, one of the um, bright lights on the uh, New York literary scene in the late 20s. And then he lashed himself to the mast of Soviet intelligence, and now was Harry White's courier and the courier for many others. He never cared much for White, but he recalled that White was, quote, perfectly willing to meet secretly. I sometimes had the impression he enjoyed secrecy for its own sake, but his sense of convenience was greater than his sense of precaution, and he usually insisted on meeting me very close to his Connecticut Avenue apartment. Chambers uh, was, got really worried at one point that his ill-mannered, morbidly mistrustful, and non-English-speaking GRU, 
that is um, Soviet military intelligence case officer, would alienate his most important source, Harry Dexter White. Uh, but when he arranged for the two to meet, White found the Russian enchanting and inspiring. Not surprisingly for a Washington Mandarin, White liked the feeling that he was in direct touch with big, important people. Um, we can look at that later. This is a drawing uh, done by uh, Will Glovinsky, my assistant, of the, um, um, the key figures in the Soviet uh, network in the mid-30s. And White is, Alger Hiss is there, um, and White is there somewhere. Um, um, after three years of meeting ch uh, chambers around, what's that? Oh, 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 I'm so glad that somebody just knows this. Um, um, White got a horrible, horrible shock. Um, at the height of the Soviet terror of 1938, Whitaker Chambers abruptly told him that he was quitting the party, quitting espionage, and he urged White to do the same. Um, White was very badly frightened that Chambers might alert the authorities, and uh, as a consequence, he lay low for the next three years. Um, it's 1941. Uh, uh, the um, uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop, uh, Hitler-Stalin pact is on. Um, U.S. and Soviet diplomatic relations have gotten very, very frigid. And anyone who's caught playing footsie with, the, with uh, Soviet intelligence agents might be expected to suffer serious consequences. But Harry White has now become one of the big important people in Washington. And of course, nobody's really watching anyway. Um, so he begins meeting with um, um, that man that you see in the upper left-hand <laughs> corner, um, who's a, uh, there's a lot of turnover in Soviet intelligence. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, one, you know, as soon as somebody learns a little English and uh, knows his way around, he gets a call to come back, uh, you know, be interrogated, be shot, and uh, etc. cetera. Um, so he begins meeting with, uh, with this young KGB officer, and, uh, and this time he's quite dutiful about observing conspiratura. He agrees to meet him at the old Ebbett Grill, which is really only around the corner from the Treasury, but he's carrying under his arm um, the New a New Yorker magazine as an agreed upon recognition signal. What was Harry White thinking? We'll never know. We will never know because um, uh, he died in 1948. Um, um, not long after he was accused of passing documents, of populating the Treasury, in particular uh, Harry, Henry Morgenthau's office with, uh, with, with communists and spies, and with blocking uh, every security uh, uh, investigation of you know, these people that, that came along. Um, the Soviet Union was not an ally of the United States in April 1941, when he began meeting with, um, I think his name is Pavlov, but I've forgotten. Um, nor was the Soviet Union an ally in 1945, when uh, shortly after the uh, Bretton Woods, and you've probably seen this famous photograph of Harry Dexter and White and, and uh, John Maynard Keynes. And this was, this was White's 
amazing lifetime achievement, um, uh, which, um, first of all, laid the basis for post-war economic recovery of the West, um, put the United States uh, made the United States the number one financial player, knocked the Brits on their backs. Um, this was a major, major achievement. Um, but, um, but a month or two later, uh, I think at the San Francisco founding meeting of the United Nations, chaired, of course, by Alger Hiss, who another, um, another one of the high, you know, high, highly talented um, officials who were was spying for the Soviets. Um, White, White was riding around in a car with a KGB officer, declaring that he was ready for any sacrifice. Uh, he was, he did, you know, he wanted to be careful because Exposure would uh, seriously damage uh, the president, but he promised that he would take these drives around town uh, from time to time. What we do know is that for White, Russia was the most powerful nation on earth, and attaching himself to the powerful was his MO. What was good for Henry Morgenthau was good for Harry White. What was good for Russia was good for America. His closest friends agreed, of course, and anyone who didn't agree wasn't his friend. To contradict or challenge him in any way was to send him into an uncontrollable rage. He had made his bet, and he was going to lie in it. All right, um, last. Um, you know, Im imaginative exercise. Put yourself in the shoes of a brilliant young German. It's 1933. You are the uh, violin playing, uh, mathematically gifted son of a remarkable evangelical minister who is on the faculty at the University of Leipzig. Um, and here it is, and you've entered the university just as the Nazis come to power. Like your three siblings, you um, sort of make a leftward turn versus the socialists, but like them, you end up in the KPD. You are ultimately, for not surprisingly, forced to seek asylum in Britain, where you end up in 1933. <coughs> and he's cute too. Um, you're tw at 20, if you're a 22 year old ref German refugee in Britain, you have to rely on the kindness of strangers. And thanks both to your brilliance and to the successful transplanting of a number of top German scientists to British universities, you receive an inordinate amount of kindness. You get to complete your PhD, to teach, to work in the, in the laboratories of world-class physicists at Bristol, Edinburgh, and Birmingham. It's true you are interned briefly after Dunkirk, shipped off to Canada uh, to a, an internment camp outside Quebec but uh, only for six months, because your scientific mem mentors, your doctor fata, um, lobby to obtain your early release. Although MI5 has known from ye for years already that you were a member of the German Communist Party, although your mentors watched you reenact the, one of the Moscow trials, playing the role of Prosecutor Vizhinsky and coldly <laughs> eviscerating the poor defendant, um, and, and a number of other things that were known. 
Um, you, um, your application for British citizen is approved. Um, and despite your, your Dr. Fata's awareness of your passion, that you're passionately pro-Russian, um, and Russia, of course, at that time is allied with Germany, you are invited to join the most secret, expensive, an important wartime project in Britain. Due to the acute wartime shortage of housing, you're even invited to live in the project leader um, and his wife's house. They treat you like a son, and that project leader is one of the two uh, Scientists, German scientists living in Britain who pointed out the po possible, the likelihood that atomic energy could have military applications. So this was um, um, a big deal. When the Americans decide that the British research team uh, should come to New York, to work on the Manhattan Project, rather than sending some of the Manhattan Project over to see what they're doing in late 1943, you are included. How do you respond? About a month after you get to New York, and you um, are no longer living at the Hotel Barbizon, but in a very nice apartment on West 77th Street. You walk over to the Broadway subway, uh, take it down to 14th Street, walk over a block, get the F train to East Broadway, and get out and walk down Henry Street, which is on the Lower East Side, to until you get to the Henry Street Settlement House. I skipped over a few pictures. This is Birmingham University before the city of Birmingham was destroyed. There's the Henry Street Settlement in New York. It's still there. It's a very, very famous, um, you know, sort of social, social welfare organization. It's February. You're carrying a green book and mysteriously, given the weather a, and the fact that you don't have a dog with you, a tennis ball, a green book and a tennis ball. And the man you're expecting to approach you does approach you. And he is indeed wearing gloves and carrying an extra pair in his hand. And he says, and that's the man, what is the way to Chinatown? And you say, I think Chinatown is closed at 5 o'clock. Who wrote this? Who wrote this? This is like so weird. But it works. You made your contact. Uh, um, and um, the two of you take another long subway ride and a taxi. And uh, finally get to a restaurant where, thank God, you can have dinner. And once you're feeling more relaxed, you can start telling him about the Manhattan Project to build an atomic bomb and your own rather high-level contributions to it. By the time that a Fuchs and Gold um, work out some better signals, um, Fuchs had actually been feeding Soviet intelligence highly classified information for more than two and a half years. His very first act of espionage involved passing along a conversation with one of his benefactors, one of his, the one that invited him to live with him and treats him like a son. Um, in June 1940, again, during the Hitler-Stalin pact, 
He mentioned his mentor's belief that atomic energy could be harnessed for military purposes. Uh, Pearls was obviously, uh, uh, that he met Pearls at a conference. It was obviously not, um, um, you know, it's loose lips, sink ship. That mentality hadn't sunk in yet. Um, and uh, and um, um, Fuchs, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, interpreted it correctly, which is why he went running to um, to this man, Jurgen Kuczynski, um, who was another refugee who came to Britain. He was an economist like so many of these characters, um, and, but also the a high official in the German Communist Party, in fact, leader of the Communist Party in Britain. When uh, Fuchs came back from his brief internment, when he had been sprung by, um, by uh, Max Born and, and Rudolf, per- Rudolf Perls, uh, the first thing he did was go to the first thing he did was go to London, where Jurgen thoughtfully threw a welcome home party for him. And what do you know? There is a GRU that is military intelligence, Soviet military intelligence colonel at the party, and um, they uh, get together, and the next two and a half years are history. What was Klaus Fuchs, who looks like such a nice young man, thinking. We actually know because he, unlike almost all of these people, confessed. Uh, And he confessed even though, in 1950, even though the authorities actually had no no, uh, evidence that they could ever take into court. Quote, when I learned the purpose of the work, that is, uh, in 19, at the beginning of 1942, when he was invited to join the British Atomic Project, when he was, um, um, uh, when he signed a, an official secrets declaration that says, um, I will you know, keep this work in confidence, um, when I learned the purpose of this work, I decided to inform Russia, Fuchs wrote. I had complete confidence in Russian policy and believed the Western allies uh, were deliber- deliberately allowed Russia and Germany to fight each other to the death. Apparently, fact-checking was not in his um, toolkit and uh, like like many adolescent men, he was a little older, but you know, being a mathematical type, uh, late to mature, he had an excessive confidence in his own judgment, and never occurred to him to check check with anyone whether whether his perception of the facts held up. In fact, he added that um, almost like an existentialist philosopher, quote, it appeared to me at the time that I had become a freie mensch, a free man. I think freie mensch has more, you know, resonates more. Because I had succeeded to establish myself completely independent of the surrounding forces of society. Uh, William Scarden, the, uh, who did the first interview with Fuchs, um, asked, showed Fuchs the original official secrets declaration that he'd signed in 1941, and he asked Fuchs if he felt bound by the pledge. And Scarden's um, um, paraphrase of Fuchs's answer is very interesting. The oath of allegiance is a serious matter and a thing to be observed, says Fuchs. At the same time, he claims freedom, he, at the same time, He claims freedom to act in accordance with his conscience should circumstances arise in this country comparable to those that existed in Germany in 1932 and 1933 
when he would act on a, lo on a loyalty which he possesses to humanity in general. This is, you know, this was before Fuchs confessed. He was, run he was running the theoretical physics division of Britain's uh, uh, nuclear project at Harwell. He was, you know, a very uh, high-ranking, high-ranking, highly trusted and highly um, accomplished um, scientist manager. And let me just, uh, okay, so here's the network that, um, that um, Fuchs was uh, part of. And uh, um, it's, um, and he was actually the, the, the link, the weak link that connected the, um, uh, the Canadian um, uh, nuclear spies with the Rosenberg, um, the Rosenberg uh, network. Uh, um, Fuchs went on, he didn't, you know, he only stayed in Manhattan for about six months. He wrote 14 out of the 17 papers that his gaseous diffusion group produced in those six months were written by Klaus Fuchs. He was a major talent. This is not a, this is not a mug shot. This is his ID, ID picture at, you know, when he got to Los Alamos. And next to him is probably the greatest uh, mathematician of the 20th century, John von Neumann, uh, who, uh, you know, besides inventing the computer and uh, um, game theory, um, co-invented with, uh, with Fuchs a patented device, an, a patented implosion device that um, should make a lot of money if hydrogen bombs ever become commercial. This is the, uh, this is the fat man, uh, the, um, the uh, plans for which um, the Soviets were very happy to receive. Um, and uh, I'll just say that, um, that uh, again, hundreds of, you know, hundreds of high-ranking, highly trusted uh, officials with great responsibilities, with um, achievements, with talents, with choices, um, got, you know, got themselves into um, uh, situations like straight and um, and white and Fuchs. And um, they weren't unmasked uh, by a um, far-seeing and uh, um, um, you know communist phobic FBI or John McCarthy. they were they were... Um, they were tripped up and exposed by people just like them. Um, in particular, Elizabeth Bentley, who, like Whitaker Chambers, uh, was part of the network and um, who, uh, for a variety of reasons, in 1945 went to the authorities. It pretty much it shut down everything uh, except for uh, the um, the atomic espionage, which was um, which was you know which Fuchs in his confession, Fuchs's confession was the string that unraveled that particular ball, and like like um, Chambers and like like Bentley. Uh, you know, these the two most important whistleblowers, Fuchs confessed not because he had to, but because he had some kind of second thoughts, some kind of really um, almost inchoate, um, um, or maybe it was his conscience, um, uh, 
Maybe it was the conscience of the 14-year-old violin player. Anyway, look, um, I'm just going to end by saying that um, that the thing that, you know, as I was preparing this talk and thinking about, you know, this is kind of a, this story has been told and retold since the late 40s. And it's true that we, you know, there's more information now, but there was a lot of information by 1950, okay? Uh, you know, again, long before uh, McCarthy held his inept and um, civil rights violating hearings, there was a lot. There were a lot of facts, and um, and. So now, you know, now it's, you know, like 99%. But somehow the story is still feels compelling. To me, um, uh, you know, and, you know, good stories are always compelling for many, many reasons. But the thing that I was th have been thinking about partly inspired by some conversations with other fellows about, about um, um, Snowden, uh, partly um, um, just, you know, just thinking about these, these talented, charming people, people like us. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, started to think about lo loyalty and the things that, and I hope that we can have a conversation about it. Anyway, look, I've trespassed on your time way too long. I thank you again, and um, um, let me know what you think. <laughs>Answer questions, or you know, or we can go and have a drink. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I, I have a yeah. question. If oh, I could. good, okay. Can you just wait one sec? I just need to, um, to do this again. Is that? You know, I really can't do. That. All right. All right. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, your time period is interesting, from say 33 <coughs> up to. The 50s, but uh, are, 48. You 48, are you planning yeah. on going further, like into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where a lot of this still went on? Why am I not going further? Yeah. Well, because it was, because it was over, OK? This particular moment in time, um, and by that, I don't mean, you know, it's just the external situation, but <coughs> The appeal of the ideas that I talked about, you know, this, um, uh, which were based on hatred and fear and, you know, this binary world where, you know, if you're not a red, you're a fascist. And vice, um, that died by 1948. In, as a matter of fact, in Britain, it died earlier because why? The Labour Party came to power. And, you know, at a stroke of an election disproved all those specious arguments that the middle couldn't hold. And remember that the Labor Party, you know, that even Harold Lasky, who was a great um, uh, hero to Harry Dexter White and a great, uh, you know, who really suffered from, you know, Soviet philia. That Harold Lasky, when he became chairman of the Labor uh, uh, Party, uh, banned, you know, kicked out all the communists. In the United States, what killed the, le the extreme left, that is, the Communist Party, was H Henry Wallace's third party campaign and the Communist Party's disastrous decision to back his catastrophic decision. Politically, I'm speaking, it it destroyed the Communist Party. It was kicked out of every union and every every the entire you know center left wing liberals who 
during the war and immediately after were willing to work on specific issues with communists, that was over, okay? And it was because of the third party campaign, which was purely the only issue in that campaign was whether the United States should, you know, cleave to its, her bosom the Soviet Union. You know, whether this, this, the strange alliance of, of the war was going to define American foreign policy in the future. An idea, by the way, that if, you know, people had voted on it in 1944, uh, was a perfectly centrist idea. By 1948, when a number of things had happened, including Czechoslovakia, um, it was an idea that the American public and the entire liberal establishment and the labor movement, which was the only real base the American Communist Party had, rejected that position. And even Strom Thurmond, you know, if you look up third party campaigns, okay, and you get to 1948, the third party candidate who is listed is not Henry Wallace, but Strom Thurmond. So uh, that, was, that was the end. You know, after that, it became a cult, a sect, you know, of no, of absolutely no political relevance. And therefore, you know, the whole um, cultural and political environment that um, allowed young men and women um, to make disastrous sometimes decisions and some older people to make some very foolish ones no longer existed. Okay, and it never existed again. Um, and now, today, you know, today you think about the jihadist movement, uh, but not about, uh, you know, the left in any, you know, democracy. Um, yes. I have a question. <clears throat> I mean, not that we should be too surprised considering. No, that would be too surprised considering what uh, Snowden walked away with. But I'm still shocked by um, how, uh, in war, during World War II, a German scientist who is a known Communist Party member gets invited to Los Alamos to be part of the Manhattan Project, and nobody from the Secret Services picks that up. How is, okay. how is that possible? OK, first of all, MI5. Um, knew that, um, knew about uh, Fuchs's political history, okay? They knew it in 1934 when he applied for a passport. For, you know, there are several explanations. First of all, Britain was fighting for her life. Uh, and, you know, they were going to use everybody um, who had any, you know, any ability to contribute. Okay, so that was that was one. Secondly, the um, the counterintelligence, you know, the FBI were tiny then by later standards. Government was huge, huge. They were, you know, I saw a statistic which I'm reluctant to quote because I really haven't checked it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, it, uh, it was quoted in a, in a New Republic editorial about, about the um, accusations against Truman, that Truman had, you know, had knowingly uh, made Harry Dexter White the uh, director of the, you know, head of the newly created IMF after he learned of the espionage charges. Okay, that was, that, okay so this editorial said that there had been, you know, you know, since since 1946, seven million um, security checks, uh, 
some, you know, num some thousands of actual in-depth uh, FBI investigations and, you know, so many firings, okay? So, <laughs> you know, the government went from being, you know, negligible, of negligible size. I mean, the Brits always had a, an amazingly small government. The Americans had, you know, an, an amazingly small government. And, the, you know, it just mushroomed. So there were a lot of reasons that, um, that it happened. And, you know, uh, not too many years after the war, certainly by the time uh, the New Republic was writing its, um, its um, uh, editorial, uh, you know, and by the way, they had no doubt that H Harry Dexter White was guilty of, you know, everything that he was accused of being um, guilty of. Um, the, the point was that, yes, there, you know, everybody realized, you know, you're not going to run things like this um, in the future. And I just learned, you know, it's amazing what you learn, you know, when you just start, um, you know, when you prepare a talk, um, that... You know, Truman instituted these loyalty oaths, which were really, they were horrific, you know, as a sort of civil liberties uh, notion. But they were also really stupid, They, you know, because they didn't really, get, and it turns out that it was Richard Nixon who conducted the first and actually very impressive invest, congressional investigations into, into Soviet espionage during the war, who suggested to Eisenhower, well, let's, tr you know, Let's dump these, you know, Truman loyalty oaths. Let's replace them with security checks, which was, and that's what's happened. And, you know, the 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 there of course have been spies since then, but there are actually some fi some interesting figures that that this group, you know, about eighty percent of the known espionage cases were these volunteers. Okay. They weren't paid or not significant. That's not, it was no, not their motivation. They were, they were loyal to the Soviet Union. Af, you know, from 1950 to the present, um, only you know, you know, most of the known spies have been um, have had a national or tribal connection with the government for which they spy. Okay, so a complete, or they're in it for the money, like, um, okay, you know, I have such a terrible memory. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you know that um, Aldrich Ames and those people who were, you know, living, uh, you know, very lavishly on apparently tiny CIA salaries. Okay, so, you know, things have changed, and, um, and, um, I don't think there was a conspiracy, and I certainly don't think that Truman or FDR, you know, look, Harry Dexter White would have been fired in one minute if, uh, you know, if anyone, if Morgenthau or the White House knew what he was up to. Uh, but they just didn't have the means, that's what I would say. Yes. Given that so much of the uh, network <clears throat> and during the McCarthy era high profile were Jewish, in your opinion, was the uh, the Rosenberg executions based only on um, the evidence, or was there an element of anti-Semitism uh, in in the Rosenberg uh, executions? Whoa. <laughs> well, as an opponent of the death penalty. Um, you know, uh, look, uh, I don't think, I don't, I don't know of any historian who uh, d doesn't think that, uh, you know, the public opinion was, you know, remember that the Rosenbergs were caught after Klaus Fuchs. Okay, so w think about what happened in 1950. First of all, the, the Soviets had, uh, you know, had uh, tested their atomic bomb, you know, uh, Korea was invaded, and Klaus Fuchs, who had spent, you know, the war uh, turns out to be a Soviet spy. So, and uh, and this is also after several years of um, increasing mm. hostility between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, with complete change in public opinion. 
Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think I've read uh, the evidence. You know, there's no question, I think, of their guilt. Um, I was interested to see, read that Doris Lessing, you know, when she, you know, had no doubt of their guilt. Um, but, I, you know, it seems to me that in different circumstances, um, um, the wife certainly wouldn't have been executed, you know, just on the grounds that she wasn't, you know, it was really Julius who was, the, you know, the prime mover, and she was, you know, uh, a passive accessory, and she had young children. But, you know, it's really, you know, it's really hard to say, but it's certainly not true that they were um, innocent victims of anti-Semitism. You know, I don't think anybody thinks that now. Um, you know, um, no, I meant was there yeah. an element of it in the, in the death sentence, basically. I, they could have received life imprisonment. Yeah. Well, you know, these things get so particular, you'd have to read, you know, I, I would say read Ronald Radosh's book. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of these exhaustive things. It goes through every, you know, every decision, et cetera. Um, but, um, uh, you know, you don't know, you don't never know what's in people's, what's in people's minds. But it didn't require anti-Semitism to get them convicted under the law and by, if, you know, so it doesn't really uh, get us. We know that there was a lot of anti-Semitism, but it doesn't really help us uh, figure out, um, you know, this case. Go ahead. Oh, you cannot assume that. Absolutely not. Michael Strait and, um, and Anthony Blunt, they almost, all the ones who were, you know, the more privileged ones, and especially the ones who were in England and therefore closer, all went on there. You know, it's like, I don't know, um, you know, like taking an Icelandic air flight to, uh, to Europe for my generation. Uh, you know, ev everybody went to the Soviet Union. And they saw, you know, the filth. They saw the squalor. They saw the cruelty. They, um, they saw that they weren't allowed to talk to them, that no one was allowed to talk to them. They saw those things. It didn't make any difference. It made no difference. And if you read, you know, there's a wonderful book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's a psychologist who's had a huge impact on economics. Um, uh, thinking fast and slow. And it's about things like framing. It's about, you know, like this, you know, this binary. It's about, it's about, you know, sort of the fact that, that human beings aren't truly rational. I know you, you know, it's a big, that's a lot of news to you, but, um, and one way that human beings, we see what we are looking for, we connect the dots, uh, you know, in a way that is completely baseless. We're overconfident in our judgment. Okay, Harry Dexter White, you know, when I looked at the data, you know, the economic data on Soviet and American performance, and then looked at, you know, and thought, Harry Dexter White must not have looked, you know, at any data because it was, you know, the idea that the Soviet Union was the most powerful country in the world, please, it had a very big military, but it was a very, very poor country, even, you know, before. And after the war, you know, old, decadent Britain, you know, all these guys who were, um, you know, especially Burgess, who were going on about, you know, the loss of the British Empire, you know, the decadence of the West, blah, 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 you know, how fat and flabby and, you know, British society was. Well, guess what? Britain 
way outperformed um, uh, the Soviet Union after the war. I mean, it was, you know, n not even close. So, you know, uh, we see, you know, it's like, th this way love, you know, is not, you know, there is love in this. You know, you see what you want to see, what you hope to see. Yes? Um, one thing, you've described the networks and the people and et cetera, but you haven't gone into deeply as to what they actually stole. And is there any uh, lasting effect on what they stole? I mean, it's said, for example, the Soviets got the atomic bomb five years earlier because of the Rosenbergs yeah. or two years or whatever. But I mean, were these just a bunch of amateurs running around having fun? Well, uh, and what were they focusing on uh, okay. when they? All right. Okay. Well, um, you know, for, I can't give you a really authoritative answer, so I'm just going to give you, um, what, you know, my impressions now. Um, first of all, you know, in, I mean, intelligence is, um, you know, is not, um, you know. It isn't up there in sort of what determines, you know, uh, society's success or failure, or you know, um, and it's, you know, it's very, you know, it's very, very hard to make those judgments. And um, so this is, you know, this is all contested. It's, you know, generally when intelligence has a big effect. It's on something that's fleeting, like the Battle of Kharkov. Okay, John Karen Cross, yet another economist, yet another Trinity uh, graduate, um, passed the German order of battle. The exact transcript from Bletchley Park. He was one of the Bletchley Park um, cryptographers. Okay, passed it to uh, Soviet military intelligence. Now. If Churchill hadn't given this, you know, Stalin a summary version of that information also before the Battle of Kharkov, then uh, Karen Cross would have been justified in saying, okay, that one act um, led, you know, helped the Soviets win an important battle. Since his uh, effort was uh, redundant, uh, and he did many other things which, um, uh, you know, didn't have such great consequences. Anyway, anyway, I think that beyond the, you know, we know that Kim Philby, you know, Kim Philby's action, you know, led to specific deaths. The political, you know, you know, uh, knowing what the um, you know the American negotiators really thought uh, was you know surely helpful, but it's one you know of a thousand factors, and the, you know the fact is, look, first of all, the you know the Soviet intelligence services were so screwed up. First of all, you know I mean. Stalin murdered, okay, remember the, you know, the great terror that caused um, Whitaker Chambers to cut and run? Well, you know, he, he not only he murdered a lot of the um, officers in the Red Army, but he also decapitated the KGB. That's why you had these non-English speaking, you know, barely educated uh, so-called station chiefs trying to run things. Uh, secondly, and probably even worse, there was only one intelligence analyst. You know, in the CIA, there are people who gather, and, you know, their sources, their case law, you know, and then there are departments that have nothing to do with the gatherers who do the interpreting. Okay, there was only one interpreter of intelligence on in Moscow, and his name was Joseph. Okay. So, okay, and you know, his subordinates learned very quickly, you know, when they saw all their bosses, you know, being dragged off to Lubyanka, they learned that, you know, if Stalin thought that uh, there was a massive 
counterintelligence operation in Britain that they better report that. Or they better decide that maybe it's the Cambridge Five who are really um, you know, double agents. Okay, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, that, you know, people can debate all they want, you know, did it help them, you know, you know get the atom bomb soon, I'm sure it did. Did it make, you know, a, you know, a huge difference? Um, you wouldn't say so. But what it did do, you know, it made a big political difference, okay? It made a tremendous difference to hundreds and thousands of people on a very personal level, okay? And we're still talking about it now. And people are still mad about it now. You know, uh, people who feel, well, these people, you know, these people were not in some occupied, you know, part of the Soviet Union with a gun to the, you know, with a gun to the head collaborating, like most collect. These were people who had choices. People are so mad about that. And people who, who suffered because, who, you know, or whose parents lost their jobs because, you know, McCarthy then, you know, got into the act, shooting, of course, not at communists, because there really weren't any then, but at the Democratic Party, um, are mad about that. And so I think there were a lot of consequences. And I, what I hope, okay, first of all, I think it's a mystery, okay? I hope you got, I hope you got that. Just thinking about these people, um, that it's a mystery. And what, you know, and I know that, you know, hundreds of scholars, hundreds of books have been written. I'm not gonna, you know, uncover some great new, you know, revelation. But maybe, you know, um, this little, if you think about it, as little Russian nesting dolls, maybe by telling the story as a narrative with not just one character and not told as a courtroom drama, but starting with them when they're young, young and ignorant and passionate, and following that maybe I can, you know, just get inside the next, the next one. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.